Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, come tonight in my presence and pray for your spirit, Lord. Give me unction. Give me wisdom, Heavenly Father, from your word. And I pray for your presence here, Heavenly Father, to help us open our hearts to receive your word. Father, we need thy Holy Spirit. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you'll turn the book of Jonah with me tonight, I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes from this book. The book of Jonah. I'm going to title this tonight, The Reluctant Missionary. God sent Jonah on a mission trip. Trouble is, he went the wrong way. He went the wrong way. So the Lord just gave up on him and quit, and that was it with God and Jonah. Am I wrong? I sure am. In Jonah chapter number 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Just a little bit of historical background to help you to understand this, if you don't know it. Most of you already do. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Assyria is the enemy of Israel. It's like God saying to you in 1943, go to Tokyo and preach or go to Berlin and preach the word and warn these people to get right with God. That's exactly what it was because he sent him to the capital of his enemy. And, of course, Jonah didn't want to go. He didn't want to go. Uh, purely on a human standpoint and from a human perspective, he didn't want to go. But you notice here in the book of Jonah, you're going to see God's perspective. And I want to call your attention to that tonight. Just keep that in mind. God's perspective. Uh, in World War II and World War I and the war between the states and all the way back to time men been fighting wars. Uh, certain times of the years, for example, Christmas time, the troops on both sides between the war between, in the war between the states would lay down their weapons and sing Christmas carols. And uh, the officers didn't like that, but they did it anyway. And the reason they did, of course, is because they worshiped the same God. So it's awful hard to figure out whose side God was on, wouldn't it? You get in a situation like that. For example, you look at the book of Jonah right here, and, uh, you know, they're going to be in war. But whose side was he on? Well, the thing is, he's not so much interested in war as he is the souls of men. That's primary with God. That's the first thing. He'll save a uh, he'll save a Japanese, or he'll save a German, or he'll save an Italian, or he'll save an Af Af Afghan, or he'll save an Iraqi. Uh, it makes no difference to him. Christ died for all men, tasted blood for every man, and you've got to keep that in mind. There's only one nation on the face of this earth that God has set aside an angel, and he's an archangel, to stand for. That's Michael. And in the book of Daniel, chapter number 12, Michael stands for Israel. So that's the one he'll fight for. Make no mistake about it. In every case, God will fight for Israel. So therefore, if you want to stand in good favor with him as a nation, you better treat the Jews right. You better treat Israel right. And as a nation, you can keep your identity and keep your place in history and keep your standing in the world. But if you go against Israel, your place in history is finished. You'll be gone. You'll be in the dustbin of history. You'll be, you'll be passed. That's exactly what will happen. And four major kingdoms have ruled this world. Babylon was the first one. Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold. Then the Medes and the Persians were the second one. The third were the Grecians under Alexander the Great. It split up under Ptolemy, Lysimachus, Cassandra, and Seleucid. They scattered his kingdom throughout the world when Alexander the Great died. Then the one that followed that was Rome. Rome was the fourth kingdom. Rome was the mysterious kingdom. It had two legs, one of iron, one of clay, a mixture of the two. Only four kingdoms have ever ruled the world. Of all the time that uh, men's been on this earth, only four. And one of them is uh, uh, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire today is still around. It's here. It's here now. So as far as the movement of history, progression of time, the progression of powers, we're still here. We're in the times of the Gentiles. We're still living in the times of the Gentiles. We'll live in the times of the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles is finished, until God's finished dealing with the Gentiles. He's made up His bride. And once that happens... The Jew, Israel, will rise to the head of all the nations. That's coming. That's coming very soon. 
And you should be able to see that happening right now about you. You should be able to see the fact that Israel is the focal point of all of the world's policy. What will our president do as it relates to Israel? What is, is, what is, what is Britain's policy toward Israel? What is France's policy toward Israel? What is Russia's policy toward Israel? That's where it's come to. So here we have a national thing in the book of Jonah. We have a nation, the Assyrians. The Assyrians conquered Israel. They took the ten northern tribes and led them off into, Babel, in, into Assyrian captivity. The ten tribes repopulated the north. They mixed with them. They married. They intermarried. And the Assyrians and the Jews mixed and married. And a peculiar race came out of that. And they're called Samaritans. And there was a Samaritan woman in the book of John, chapter number 4, where the Lord uh, talked with her at Jacob's well about her salvation. So the Samaritan is a product of Israel losing its sovereignty in the ten northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes. And this is the very nation that God sent Jonah to to preach. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange? In the Old Testament, here we have... The divine sovereign God of Israel, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, sending a missionary to a bunch of pagans in Assyria. Are you following that? Think about that for a moment. He's sending a missionary to a pagan land, a pagan country. And he had a simple message when he walked into the city. He said, 40 days, God is going to overthrow this place. He gave them a warning. Forty days, God's going to overthrow it. Now, if you remember, three strangers came to Abraham when he was at his tent. These three strange strangers came to the tent of Abraham. And one of them said to Abraham, Shall I hide from my servant that thing I'm about to do? And that, of course, was the angel of the Lord. It was the Lord himself. And uh, what he was about to do was to rain fire and brimstone on five pagan cities. Five. But here, judgment had already been passed. No opportunity to get right. They had already crossed the line. There wasn't enough left in the city to spare it. But here in the book of, here in the book of Jonah, it's a remarkable thing because 60,000 people lived in this city. It took three days of hard walking to get from one end of it to the other. That's a big town. That's a big city took three solid days without stopping, walking all day long to get from one end of Nineveh to the other end. Here's one lone man sent to a city of 60,000 people to get them right with God. Boy, that could have overwhelmed him any time. They could have done away with Jonah in a heartbeat. But the thing is, Jonah's a tough boy. Anybody that can spend three days in a whale's belly is pretty tough. Amen. See, Jonah didn't realize what he was made out of. Amen. He didn't until he was put to the test. He just chose the easy route, like most of us do. We have a tendency to do that. And so the Almighty said, Now, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to go over there, and I want you to preach to them. All right, that's the first commission, the first call. That was his call. I've talked to preacher after preacher after preacher, said, Now, preacher... God called me to preach and I ran for 10 years or I ran for 15 or I ran for 20 years. I ran from God. And then finally, I answered the call to preach. Now, why would a man run from that, do you think? You know why? It's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. It's scary, number one, to think God's called you. <laughs> scary, number two, when you think about what he's called you to do. And so when you consider that, Jonah said, appreciate it, Lord. I know you know what you're doing. You're smart. And you got, you got the best. You got, every, you, got the, you got everything's good as far as you're concerned. Appreciate all that, but I got other plans. <laughs> See you later, alligator. <laughs> and so Jonah bought him a ticket, and he got on a ship, and he headed to Tarshish. Now, is there somebody in the New Testament associated with Tarshish? The Apostle Paul. He sure is. And essentially, he took off in the opposite direction. I'm out of here, he said. <laughs> so he thought he could get a ticket and get on a ship and take off, and he'd be out of here. He didn't realize that God Almighty that called him is able to follow him. Didn't realize he's able, he that walks on the water can surely stir it up. And that's exactly what he did. Amen. And how foolish we are to think that we can run from God. But some of you are running tonight. 
Amen. That's right. You're going to run from God till you catch Him. That's right. Amen. In Jonah chapter number 1 verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So God's aware of the wickedness of the pagan too. Not only Israel. But Jonah, see the disjunctive conjunction? But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Notice it's from the presence of the Lord because he ran from him. And went down, notice he was going down when he left the presence of the Lord. He went down. Everywhere in the New Testament, when you go to Jerusalem, you go up. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. But every reference of any travel to Jerusalem is always up. I don't care if where you came from is Mount Hermon, which is higher than Jerusalem. You're still going up to go to Jerusalem. The reason for that is because it's the city of the great king. It's the presence of God. And there's nothing higher than the presence of God. So wherever God places his name and that's his presence, you get no higher than that. And so the Bible says that Jonah went forth from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Tarshish, you see. Because to go away from God, folks, you never get any higher than where you were with him. When you go away from him, you're going down. You're going down. You're going to go down. I don't care how big you are, you're going down. And so the Bible says that he ran. And verse number 3, this is his response. He ran from him. This is the commission God gave him. Now it's time for the Lord to intervene, verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man to his God. Notice all these different pagans, see, crying to their gods. They're crying to their gods. And cast forth the waters that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. The shipmaster came to him and said to him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. We've called on our God, and I call on your God. We've got about 15 different gods. Surely one of them is going to hear us. See, this is pure, yeah. Call on your God now. Make a difference. who. Maybe he's stronger than our God. In the Old Testament, the pagan one time said, well, your God's the God of the mountains, and our God's the God of the valleys, and then there's a God of the hills. You see, they're very superstitious and very pagan. When they took uh, Dagon, and they put the, the, ark of the, temple, the Ark of the Tabernacle into the Temple of Dagon, Dagon didn't fare too well with him. He didn't make it. They had to prop him up. I'd have been changing gods, wouldn't you? If you have to prop your God up, you're in pretty bad shape. If you have to hold your God up, that's pretty bad. But you, th you see, the thing is, once a man is steeped in superstition... Once he is steeped in, 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 in superstition, what is superstition? Superstition is the wisdom of men set over against the wisdom of God. Men learn by finding out, by searching, by pumping their mind up, by patting themselves on the back, by, by achievement. The only way you'll ever know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is by revelation. He's got to show himself to you. That humbles us. We don't like that. We don't like that. And so they said, now call on your God too. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. They said everyone to his fellow, come, let us cast lots. We may know for whose cause this evil has come upon us. Let's gamble a little bit. And by chance it may hit the right one. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter who, which God answers. Just let the God answer. This is why Elijah showed up. Remember? You had Baal on one hand. And you had Jehovah on the other. And, the, and, and Elijah the prophet stood right before them and pointed his finger at them. And he said, if God be God, if Jehovah be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve Baal. This day I'm going to let Baal stand against God. Now I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe in this with all of my soul and all of my spirit. There is a God in this world... And he's the God of this world. And men that don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, they know that God. I'll pit my God against their God any day of the week. You try him. You try your God, and I'll try my God. And we'll find out which one's God. Amen. There's only one God. Just one. There's only one that can protect you and feed you and clothe you and put a roof over your head and keep you safe and take care of you and save your soul and give you an eternity in heaven. There's just one. 
Just one. But the Bible says, So they cast lots, the lot fell upon John. They said to him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil has come upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? They were full of questions. <laughs> he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Jonah had his theology right. He was a Hebrew. He knew there's one God. He knew that. There's just one. Then were the men exceeding afraid and said to him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do to thee that the sea may be calm to us? For the sea wrought was tempest, temp uh, tempestuous. And he said to them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Notice the noble character of the pagan. The noble character of the pagan. They were trying to save his life. They were trying to save his life. The noble character of the pagan. Wherefore they cried to the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Notice in the heart of men a conscience and an understanding of, of rudimentary truths. Even though they did not know Jehovah, in their heart they knew the difference between right and wrong. It was burned in them. So they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. The men feared the Lord exceedingly. Notice it's Jehovah they're fearing. And offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. That's all they could do. Notice that he doesn't reveal himself to them. Notice that the revelation of God to these men is very limited. Have you noticed? Have you noticed that? Why is that? Because the more He reveals Himself to you, the more you're responsible. The more you know of Him, the more you're accountable. To whom much is given, the same is much required. When you sin against blazing light, you're going to hell, and you're going straight to hell. In other words, when you reject the truth, when it's laid before you. In Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, He said, Because they loved the lie and believed not the truth, then God's going to send them a strong delusion. That they may be damned. You're learning something about the character of God. He worried about 60,000 Assyrians. What's the point? He cared for 60,000 Assyrian pagans. Idolaters. When he called Abraham from Ere of the Chaldees, Abraham and his father Terah were idolaters. But God called him out of idolatry. We don't have anything to glorify ourselves over. We have nothing to be. We have nothing that we can. That nothing that we can say to God tonight. Well, Lord, I'm glad you helped me out. He didn't help you out. He pulled you out. If we could understand that absolute dependence upon Him pleases God more than anything. In John 15, He said, "Without me, you can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. We attempt to do it by the power of the flesh, by cunning ability." By treachery and deceit. And it won't get the job done. For not by power nor by might. But by my spirit saith the Lord. Amen. It's an amazing thing when I see the heart of God. But I'll hurry up through this. Because there's an awful lot in the book of Jonah. So what happened to Jonah? Verse number 17. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The Lord Jesus Christ said it was a whale. That's good enough for me. So what happened? Well, in chapter number 2 and verse 2, Jonah said, Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. That did it. Did you hear that? He said, I was in hell, and I cried, and you heard me. That changed Jonah. That changed him. Jonah was changed in whale college. <laughs> he was. He really was. He was changed in the iron furnace. When Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah came out of that furnace of fire, and the fourth was likened to the Son of God, they were never the same again. Their hair wasn't even singed. It didn't burn their clothing. Didn't you have a smell of smoke on them? But they went in bound. 
And it burned their bindings. That's all it burned. The only thing the fire can do to a Christian is purge you and make you freer. Stronger. That's all it can do. But the fire will consume the unbeliever. And this is why he says over there in the book of Acts, when he, the Holy Ghost, has come, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. Somebody said that fire is reference to hell. When I study that and I look at that and begin to think to myself, listen, there is no fear of hell for a born-again believer. Amen. Hell can't touch you if you're born again. Amen. You're safe from hell. But fire, fire, oh yeah. Fire is something else. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 29, that our God is a consuming fire. Right. Right. But the Bible says that those cloven tongues like as of fire came down upon each one of them. A purging took place. The tongue represented what they were going to say, what come out of their heart. And from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost in the day that the church of God was given birth. This was that birth. This was the birthing process. This is when the church became a reality in spiritual power. And that spiritual power is what the Baptists overlook and give it lip service and talk about it and just pass it on like there's nothing to it. And that filling of the Holy Spirit of God is promised to every last one of us. If you'll draw nigh to God, if you'll get serious about it, God will pour fire on your soul and fire inside your soul and purge out the dross and He'll lift you up and fill you full of power and joy. And my friend, you can go forth in the glory of God. Amen. Yeah. Fire. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and typology walked right through hell. They did. In typology, they walked right through hell. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, most folks know them as that, walked right through hell. And when they came out the other side, man, they were in better shape than they were when they went in. <laughs> Amen. 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 So he said, I was in hell. I cried. If he hadn't heard him, he would have been destroyed. Right? When you're in your lowest point and your back's against the wall and all your friends forsaken you and your props knocked out from under you and you have nothing to live for and everything turns dark and God doesn't hear you, you're finished. Because He's the only one that can pull you out of it. Because they will forsake you and people will turn on you and they will stab you in the back. They will cut your throat. Some even you think are your best friends. He won't. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. He won't. A few years ago, God blessed me on that back porch. Right after that, I mean, I shouted and praised God and walked on top of a mountain for weeks and months and years. I mean, I walked high, friend. I didn't even touch the ground. Something happened to me I wanted to tell everybody in the world about. I just wanted to know, listen, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. There's a filling and a power of God that most people don't know anything about. But it's there for you. It can happen. It did happen. And then my friend Satan came after me, boy. And I mean, he came after me with a vengeance. He came after me to destroy me. And he almost did. God let me hit the bottom. And when I hit the bottom, and it was dark and no friends and nobody. And nobody understands what's that like until you've been there. He came to me again. And gently and slowly he led me out of that, step by step, reminding me of the things that I truly believe and the things that I know. Faith is built on faith, from faith to faith. The things you know, God builds you on that. You don't walk in, in theory and you don't walk in abject thought. Uh, you, you walk in faith. What do you know? Do you know you're born again? Step on that and go forward from it. Hey man, you know your sins are forgiven? Step on that and go forward from it. Do you know what it is to be full of the Holy Ghost? Step on that and go back to it again. Because it will come back. And it has. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God He'll fill you. See, I don't deserve it. If you deserved it, He wouldn't fill you. It just seems like preachers, that old sorry low-down dog, God blesses the most. Amen. I'm glad to be a junkyard dog. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll bark for you. God, if it takes for God to fill me, hey, man, I'll do it, buddy. <laughs> Throw me a bone. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Problem's pride. That's what's killing us, folks. I mean, that's a, that's a way to look at it, but that's the problem. Pride. But anyway, let's move through this quickly. He was in hell for three days. And the Lord said, as Jonah was in the heart of the earth, in the, in the belly of the whale, three days, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And the whale belched him up. Can you imagine Jonah when he hit the ground? He comes up out of the belly of that whale, and he's got that, uh, what's that acid in, in your stomach that, uh, what is it? It's, yes, but there's a name for it. Hydrochloric. Hydrochloric acid. I mean, been working on him for three days. He came out of there bleached. Got seaweed hanging out of his hair. I mean, he's got it in his nostrils, and he looks like he just rose from the dead. Essentially, he's dead. I mean, he's a typology. If somebody's been dead and rose up, and here he comes stomping up on the, on the shore out of that whale's belly, and he stinks, and imagine what he smells like and looks like. And he looks at those people looking at him, and they think, where did you come from? And he says, Repent. He's got one message. That's his message. He's got one message. And buddy, he preached it too. And they listened to him. I suppose when he started walking into Nineveh, the seaweed was dry by then. And he was still bleached white. And he looked like a ghost walking down the street, and I no wonder the people ran from him. He looked like something out of the twilight zone. He did. Three days and three nights in a whale's belly. And here he comes preaching. God knows how to call his man, doesn't he? He does. I'm saying he prepared him. He prepared him for the ministry. Notice what it says in chapter number 3. I like this. Verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I like that. God said to Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, yes, Lord. I want you to go down to the potter's house. All right. Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. Show you something. This is an object lesson. This is where you learn visually, okay? You can't miss this one. See the potter? Yes, Lord. Watch him. That thing's spinning and he's got a piece of clay. The potter puts his hands over here in the water. Never touches the clay without first the water. Then he gently touches it. Pressure one point, pressure another. He knows exactly what he's doing. He has in mind what he wants to make. And he's creating something of beauty out of a pile of mud. Something happens, though. The Bible says it was marred in the hand of the potter. So he just picked it up and he threw it out the door. Am I wrong? He didn't pick it up and throw it out the door. He made it again. He didn't quit. He made it again. I bet every one of you have been made again. I know I have. He made it again. He made it again. As it seemed good to him, as it pleased him. Yeah. You say, well, now wait a minute, preacher. I cooperated with God. I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. Oh, did you now? <laughs> Tell me something. How smart's a piece of clay? You know what he said to them? He said, as the clay is in the hands of the potter, so are you. And you represent this whole nation. The hand of the second time. I'm glad for the second chance, aren't you? Sometimes I don't believe anybody ought to have a second chance. Oh, shut up. You've had 15 or 20. Before you got saved by the grace of God, God dealt with you time and time and time and time and time again. Amen. This highbrow, pious, holier-than-thou stuff. Well, no, I'll tell you. No, 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 no. God was gracious and merciful time and time again. Second time. Now, when he came the second time, was Jonah ready to go? The word of the Lord came to him the second time. You ever notice how you can't get people to do anything until they're ready? You can't do it. Ideas, you know, I mean, the need. There was a need beforehand. Uh, sweet talk. All this. No, that won't get the job done. They've got to go through whale college. They've got to be ready. That's right. They've got to be ready. They've got to be ready. You take your children. You've raised, how many ever raised any children? You've disciplined them. You've trained them. You've tried to teach them. You've tried to do the best you can with them. And time and time again, they rebel against you. They won't listen to you. They won't, they won't, they won't, they won't. And some of them will not learn a thing till they go out into the world on their own and get burned good. And then one day, they'll raise their head up and say, Boy, my mom and daddy knew more. I'm smarter than I thought they were. 
I'm the fool. <laughs> they weren't near as crazy as I thought they were. Now, some of them get there in their 20s. They learn that. Some of them, it takes them to their 30s before they learn. Some of them so stupid, they've got to go into their 40s before they learn it. That's the truth, folks. To realize that mom and dad aren't so dumb after all. That it pays to work. It pays to be honest. It pays to have some morality and character associated with it. It pays to obey the law. It pays to consider tomorrow what may be affected by what you're doing today. These are the things that when, you, when you're my age, if you don't know them by my age, have you ever heard the term, there's no fool like an old fool? You ever heard that? That's right. There is no fool like an old fool. When you hit your 60s and you don't have any sense, you're never going to have any sense. <laughs> you never will. Forget it. You, if you haven't learned by the time you hit 60, you're never going to learn. Amen. I went in the military. I heard these guys say, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. I'm going in the military. <laughs> I'm serious as I can be. I had them say that. <laughs> nobody going to tell me what to do. I'm going in the military. <laughs> hey, okay. <laughs> Those drill instructors at Paris Island just, just rubbing their hands. Boy, when you get on that, get that pull in there on a bus, they're waiting for you. Ha <laughs> ha. Fresh meat. Ha ha ha. Nobody's going to tell you what to do. They're going to tell you when to go to bed. They're going to tell you when to get up. They're going to tell you when to take, go to the head and take a shower. They're going to tell you what to eat, when to eat. They're going to tell you where to go. They're going to tell you what. They're going to tell you every move. And he told me this. He said, I'm your mama and I'm your daddy. And if I say jump, you jump. And if I say, if I say jump, you say how high. And he did. Yeah, nobody's going to tell you what to do. Okay. <laughs> Don't go in the military. <laughs> Amen. Now, I know them. I'm sure the Army and the Navy and the rest of them, the Air Force and Coast Guard are the same thing. You're going to obey orders. So finally, we come down to the last chapter. The last chapter, chapter number 3 and verse number 10, the Bible said God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do to them, and he did it not. The reason he did, because the king of Nineveh, verse number 6, sat down in sackcloth and ashes, verse 5, called a fast day and repented. He believed the preaching of the word. But now look at Jonah. We've got to deal with him. Now look at it. He was sent the second time. He agreed. Been to Whale College. He's learned one good lesson. You're wasting your time to try to run from God and not do what he told you to do. But now his heart gets involved. And look at Jonah. He starts, he starts, he starts philosophizing with God. He starts talking about high things with him. Look at chapter number 4 and verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly and was very angry. He wanted God to destroy them. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before the Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, <laughs> and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. <laughs> you know what he said? He said, when you told me to go to Nineveh the first time, I told you, I told you, that I know you, and I don't want you to do what I know you'll do if I go preach. That's what he just said. He's reminding the Lord for his reason for running away. That's right. See, remember I told you they're the enemies of Israel. He said, I told you, Lord, I'm reminding you here. I know you. <laughs> and he did. Did he say one thing about God that wasn't true? He is merciful. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He will forgive sin. And Jonah didn't like it because it was his enemy. See what I mean? See how we are? Aren't you glad that salvation is not in this hand, that hand, this building, the Baptist church? Aren't you glad that we don't dispense salvation? Aren't you glad that he didn't put it in the hands of a man? Aren't you glad that salvation is of the Lord? Because we may be mortal enemies, and I want you to go to hell. But Christ tasted death for every man. And he'll save your enemy. 
You see what I mean? I'm glad for that. I'm glad that salvation is of the Lord in the simple sense that my relationship with God is not built on my relationship with men. My relationship with God is personal between God and me. I'm glad for that. I am. Most men, before they would allow you to have a relationship with God, will make sure that you have a relationship with them so that they have part in it or take some kind of pleasure from it. Now look at the lesson God teaches Jonah. He's not done with him. Here's another lesson. Jonah has to learn another lesson. But look carefully at this one. Chapter number 4 and verse 4. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? Why are you angry, Jonah? So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city. There made him a booth, sat under its shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. He's going to see what God's going to do with this bunch. The Lord God repented of, prepared a gourd, and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. God gave him comfort. Now watch this. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. My. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Elijah? You remember Elijah? And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He said, I am angry to the point that I want to die. Now watch this. Then said the Lord, You had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither made its grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. In plain words, this was a little insignificant nothing. Nothing. A little insignificant nothing, but you got comfort from it. So really, Jonah, the only thing that really mattered to you was your personal comfort and your feelings. And look how God thinks. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons? Twenty, forty, sixty. Sixty thousand people that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and all so much cattle. Do you realize that, that in God's mind, temporal things are meaningless? I don't mean a thing. But a human soul is very important. When the Lord Jesus Christ was coming from the north down into the south, he would go normally down the Jordan Rift. That's the way the Jew would go. He would go out of his way not to go through Samaria. And it's the Jordan Rift. We went that way. Every time we've gone to the Holy Land, we've gone through the Jordan Rift. That's where the Jordan River flows. But he said, I must needs go through Samaria. Do you know why? Because when he went to that place where Jacob's well was located, there was a woman there, just one woman. One woman. He went out of his way way out of his way, miles out of his way, so he could go by and talk to one woman. One woman. One woman. Do you know that when he got on that ship, he got on a ship, he had fed 5,000. He got on a ship, went across the Sea of Galilee, went to the other side and went off into the mountains to get away from the mob. He left them behind. The Bible says he left that great multitude behind. He wanted away from them. Yet he went out of his way, miles out of his way, to go to one woman. Strange, isn't it? It's strange, isn't it? He doesn't think the way we do. He doesn't think the way we do. He doesn't. His way is not our way. His mind's not our mind. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. And his mind, his thoughts, than our thoughts. There's something about God and his character that pulls us up. It really does. Because when I see the way God deals with men, and then I see the way men deal with men, there's a difference. There's a vast difference. Just one person. God could meet in a mega church. 
30,000 people in there jumping up and down and screaming and praising God. And one soul in there that really wanted the Lord, he'd come to that one soul in a heartbeat. He'd do it. He'd do it. And he'd do that for you tonight. He'd do it for you. I don't know what Jonah ever learned from it. and never, The Bible doesn't say, but uh, we know Jonah listened to him. We know he listened to him. 60,000 people. 60,000. Ah, what a thing. Father, in thy name we pray. Use what I've said tonight for the glory of God. You don't see it the way we do. You go save our enemies. And we bless your name for it. If you'll save my enemy, then you'll save my family. If you'll save my enemy, then you'll save me. If you'll save my enemy, you'll save anybody. And I'm thankful for that tonight. In thy holy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake. Everybody raise your hand tonight and say, Preacher, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want the power of God on my soul. If you ask Him for it, expect Him to do it. Expect Him to. Expect Him to. Believe and you receive. <coughs> expect Him to. He will. He'll do it. If, you got any, if you're in here tonight with a burden on your soul, bearing you down, beating you to death, ask Him to teach you how to cast your care upon Him. Because it's not really human nature to know how to do that. Ask God to teach you how to cast your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Ask Him for that. Are you in here tonight and you've never been born again? You've never been saved? You don't know the Lord? you got a head full of knowledge, but you don't have Him in your heart? Would you raise your hand and say, Yes, preacher, that's me. And I don't want to die like this. Pray for me. Anybody? Anybody? I think most people in here tonight would believe in a heartbeat that the Lord Jesus is coming soon. I do. I believe it. I believe it. Are you ready? The Bible says it will appear the second time without sin to salvation for those that look for His appearing. Father, we've, I've done what you put on my heart, Lord. I bless your name for it. Father, I thank you for Jonah. I thank you for the lessons we learned from the book of Jonah. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for this prophet, Lord. He was a prophet. And for the word that he preached and for the truth, our Heavenly Father, from this great book. God, help us tonight, Lord, to apply this to our heart. Lord, to glean something from it, something that's good for us, that will be instructive for us. Our Father, not that we draw wisdom from this world. We don't need this wisdom. But, our Heavenly Father, your wisdom, that we see things the way you see them. Teach us that. Give us that wisdom. Give us that knowledge. In thy sweet holy name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen.